I'm very excited for today's guest speakers, Mark Fenstermacher and Jessica Morse. I want to introduce myself, Kevin Wright. I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Marin County Parks and also a steering committee member of the California Landscape Stewardship Network. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, the California Landscape Stewardship Network is a diverse network of organizations, individuals, and sectors from across the state seeking to advance collaborative cross-jurisdictional solutions to our greatest climate and natural resource needs. And so we seek to partner with organizations like yours um, at the federal, state, and local level, um, practitioners and policymakers alike, to seek ways to work across boundaries and do work at landscape scales to increase our impact efficiencies and um, address our biggest challenges. So um, welcome in the year ahead, uh, Devin Landry, who's supporting me on the back end, is going to drop a few links in the chat. So keep an eye there. We are going to focus on a couple key policy areas um, in addition to just generally supporting this landscape scale work across the state. One is implementation of the cutting the green tape uh, permitting efficiency recommendations that came out this year. We're excited about those. Also um, supporting implementation of recommendations in an early detection rapid response white paper that was just released. Uh, the California network did that in partnership with uh, the California Invasive Plant Council. And so that paper will be shared with you. We'll also be diving deeper into supporting sustainable recreation across boundaries and rolling out a collaborating well training module to support collaborative leadership in regions across the whole state, as well as the country. Um, Devin Landry is going to share information at the very end of this webinar about how to sign up for the California Landscape Stewardship Network's uh, email list so you can keep up to date on all that's happening. So be on the lookout for that. In just a moment, you'll hear from two guest speakers. The first will be uh, Mark Fenstermacher from Pacific Policy Group. Mark is here to talk to us today about the budget process as a whole. So what the timeline looks like, what's gonna happen over the next several months, as well as what's currently um, proposed by the governor in the natural resources budget. And then we're gonna be joined by Jessica Morris, Deputy Secretary of Forest Resource Management with the California Natural Resources Agency. And she'll talk with us about um, the governor's proposal around wildfire resilience and forest health investments, as well as just give a general overview about what's happening regarding fire and forest management across the state um, and the issues that are prompting this year's budget proposal. Before that, I just wanna start us off by sharing uh, a bit on a personal level um, from a book that I love um, and my family loves it's called Beauty and the Beast. This is a beautiful book um, that was put together by Rob Badger and Nita Winter, um, local artists in Marin. And it's really the book I pull out when the air is full of smoke and I'm home with my uh, seven-year-old trapped inside. It's full of amazing wildflowers and also some really inspiring essays. And I felt like the very last essay in the book was written by uh, actually a university student out of Denver named Kenna Kuhn. Um, called Hope, Joy, and Inspiration, really captures the work of the network and um, I feel like provides a good lens for our conversation today. And if you just join me, I'm going to read this to you all right now. To enact real change, we must determine as a community what actions most effectively serve our needs. We have to collaborate across disciplines and cultures and remain persistent in the face of adversity. By applying these basic principles, we can be assured that our actions against climate change can make a difference. This is also where inspiration and joy play their greatest role. They nurture and sustain our tenacity and resolve in challenging times. The joy of building community, of making purposeful choices, and of dedicating time to meaningful activities is immeasurably fulfilling for me. It fuels my optimism and drives me forward to continue on this uphill path. So I look forward to the joy of building community with all of you. And with that, I'd like to invite Mark Fenstermacher to join me in a conversation about the budget process. Welcome, Mark. And Devin, if you just turn on Mark's, uh, there you go, perfect. Hi. Hey, Kevin, thanks for thanks having for... me. Well, I'll start out um, 
I didn't put it in the chat, but uh, Mark Fenstermaker, two, I'm going to say two things I'm looking forward to this year. Uh, one, I, I'm hoping to actually step foot in the Capitol. It feels weird to have been outside the Capitol halls since mid-March. Um, there are times where I, I get kind of sick of being in there, but right now I really miss it. And the second thing I, I'm looking forward to is uh, my five-year-old daughter getting off of distance learning and actually going to school. Um, so just quickly and generally on the, on the budget, there's a couple of things I always look for at the outset when it comes to natural resources funding. And the first is what's the total, what's the overall picture? Uh, but sometimes that can be a little bit misleading in how the resources budget maybe has improved or, or regressed year after year. And uh, to me, the number one indicator is how much general fund money is going towards natural resources. And this year, uh, general fund is, is a total of $4.6 billion, which uh, I, I think is pretty high compared to most years. I, I, I think that's a pretty good improvement. And most of the proposals that I've seen for uh, individual funding increases are generally coming from the general fund. Um, second thing I look for is what are the other fund sources that are are providing dollars for natural resources projects and typically we see most of the money coming from bonds um, but the cap and trade revenue uh, can provide opportunities and we see a fair amount of cap and trade revenue coming this year and um, the total revenue for the program has has bounced back from last year and that's a, a, a good signal that um, going forward, we should see cap and trade continue to deliver funding and revenue for the state. And um, at least for forest health and fire mitigation purposes, um, I think it's gonna continue to be a reliable resource for those activities. Uh, coming back this year was the Healthy Soils Funds. Um, it had fallen out of the cap and trade proposal for a year or two and we see it come back. I think it's uh, $30 million is proposed total for healthy soils. Um, so a pretty good uh, chunk of change for, um, you know, climate smart ag through healthy soils from, from cap and trade. And then we do continue to see uh, bond funding being proposed. Most of it coming from Prop 68. Um, we see some, some funding going towards Wildlife Conservation Board for uh, ecosystem, watershed resilience, protection, restoration uh, funding. It's not all Prop 68, but the majority of it is. And, you know, we are now in a really year three of Prop 68. Um, typically, uh, bond funds are spent out on about a five to six year time frame. So as most folks probably know, there is uh, at least one climate resilience, natural resources bond proposal currently in print. SB 45, I anticipate seeing another one coming forward. And I think it just uh, it shows how important bond funds are to the natural resources budget. But overall, I think this is a really um, positive looking budget for natural resources, much better than I was anticipating coming into the year. Um, I mentioned healthy soils um, that obviously there's the billion dollars for uh, forest health and fire mitigation. Um, there's money for parks for deferred maintenance, um, implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, there's money for, for sweep, and um, there's a, a, quite a few programs proposed at Fish and Wildlife for things like wetlands management, uh, access for all, and vegetation mapping. So it looks, it looks really strong. Um, you know, the budget is really benefiting from uh, what is likely to be a one-time windfall, and the prospects of the budget over the next two to three years are that uh, we go back to the red. Um, so this is, this is really gonna be our one shot this year to get a big influx into resources funding. And so the process uh, going forward, really now that the governor's put his proposal out there is it's the legislature's turn to react. And we're gonna see the budget uh, committees in both the Senate and the assembly really get going next week. Um, there are a number of what are known as early action proposals, and I'll, I'll describe those in a minute, um, that will move the legislature to consider those really quickly. And then um, the rest of the budget will be considered through uh, subcommittees through February, March, April. Um, I saw a calendar schedule release this morning. It looks like they're gonna accelerate their, their schedule compared to, to most years and actually 
um, start the subcommittee process in early to mid-February. Um, that plays out through mid-May when the governor uh, proposes a revise, uh, looks at all the returns from the tax filing deadlines and kind of trues up what the proposal was uh, or proposal is that we saw come out a couple of weeks ago, makes any adjustments depending on uh, did we exceed the revenue projection or we short. Um, so we see that May revise come out uh, mid-May and then there's a, a month long sprint to June 15th, which is the day by which the legislature has to return its proposal to the governor. Um, he has until June 30th to sign that or veto portions thereof, and then the new fiscal year starts July 1st. I mentioned um, these early action proposals. Um, this is because the budget process last year got uh, screwed up because of COVID, um, both from a, a timing standpoint and a process standpoint, but also from the revenue side, and there were a lot of cuts made, um, a lot of dollars that weren't appropriated. And so the, the governor is proposing to uh, appropriate some funding back into the 2020-21 budget. Um, these are the early action items. And what that does is, should the legislature approve those proposed appropriations in the next week or two, that funding will be delivered to the implementing departments and agencies immediately. Um, they don't have to wait until July 1st to get that funding. And so they can, they can start moving on, putting grants out, putting dollars out for projects really quickly. And so that's exciting that um, there was that recognition that uh, the budget last year was, was uh, short because of the, the pandemic and that there's a lot of need right now uh, to get projects on the ground. Um, and then there's the rest of the funding proposed uh, through the, the normal process as I described. So we should see um, in the next week or two, the legislature consider those early actions proposals potentially make some some tweaks to those. And then uh, I would uh, hope that they vote those through um, probably, you know, by the end of the month, if not the first week of February. And and then, you know, our friends at um, various departments and and like Jessica at agency will have some some more funding that we can start working toward. Um, you know, I think I think it's important to highlight the fact that just because uh, the governor has proposed this funding it does not mean it's a slam dunk. Um, there are a lot of pressing issues as everybody is aware of, and there's a lot of needs, which means the legislature is going to look at the various places they feel are priorities to put funding and make the, those appropriations. It is a negotiation and uh, there will be a lot of different advocates coming to the legislature, uh, pushing for their piece to either be increased or include it if it's not there, both on the early action side and also in the full June budget. So I know a number of, uh, uh, of groups that are joined today and recognize some of them as my clients will be advocating for uh, support of the governor's budget. And I think it's important that we um, push for resources funding to remain as strong as possible, knowing again that there are a lot of other needs out there and it's not to diminish those needs but if our voice is not uh, present and heard, it, it makes it easier for legislators to look at where those other needs are and, and move appropriations that way. Um, so it, it's, uh, you know, we're in about a five month timeline, but it does go really quick. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions to help folks navigate that process. Thanks, Mark. That was a great update. Um, and we will be having questions at the end. And Mark, I know we'll bring you back after we hear from Jessica. Um, I am curious if you have any suggestions for what organizations might do immediately um, around the budget process. You know, what should they focus on? What should they be doing right now? Yeah, so in the, in the next couple of weeks, um, it really is those early action proposals, uh, knowing that the legislature will consider those immediately. And if there are um, proposals that, that you feel strongly about, uh, putting in a support letter, reaching out to your legislator, letting them know you support those pr uh, proposed appropriations, and then really digging through um, the rest of the, the budget and thinking about what items you really support, what items may be missing or, or may be enhanced. Um, 
you know, it's not just dollars that come through the budget process. There is policy kind of wrapped around it as well. So, um, That's an important point. you know, trying to engage with the subcommittee process is really the best way to go about that. Thank you again, Mark. And we'll see you at the end. Thanks, Kevin. And now I want to move to Jessica. Again, we're going to take questions at the end, but please feel free to use the question and answer tool at the bottom of your screen to type in questions and uh, we'll try to get to many of those. Jessica, welcome. It's so good to have you um, at this time. I've been asking a lot of government employees this as you know, one government employee to another, but I'm curious just in getting started here, if you find yourself doing something completely different this last year, whether it was COVID related or fire related, disaster service work, what have you been up to? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it just feels like I think 2021 for 2020 and its extension um, have, you know, felt like a personal stress test for all of us and compounding crises one on top of another. I mean, at the beginning of the we had to take a 20,000 person agency that was a place-based organization and within a week uh, transition it to remote working um, across all of these departments and all of our boards and commissions and uh, get executive orders and laws and things changed to be able to allow us to be able to keep people at home and safe and um, trying to figure out the relationship between COVID and wildfire smoke. And, um, you know, during then, you know, once we got everyone settled down, then we had the worst fire season in California history uh, with 4.1 million acres burned. And on top of that, we're trying to figure out what is that relationship between COVID and wildfire and trying to make decisions based on science that isn't fully um, finished yet. And, and so trying to get CARB to partner with us to really encourage people to do air filters and try to keep that smoke um, out of their lungs so that we didn't have, uh, uh, you know, compounding impacts from that fire on a public health crisis that was already existing. So it just, it feels like it's been kind of one crisis after the next, um, you know, COVID ate our budget last year. And so we had to then try to navigate how do we prepare for fire season 2021 um, with resources that were limited. And so we're so grateful um, that even in the face of a difficult budget season that we've been able to get real resources to attack the scale of the crisis. So it has been certainly, um, I, I think like everyone, it's been a sense of being nimble, being fast, um, being responsive and expecting sort of the uh, most extreme scenario that no one planned for. I feel like Page three of the governor's forestry task force report that was released around the time of the budget said it all. It was that big pie chart that showed the largest fires in recent <laughs> years. And just to see what's happened in the last two years is really astonishing. I mean, I think we all knew it, but to see it visually like that was really striking. And I think really kicks off our discussion today really well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about what it means for Cal Fire and our, for, and our fire suppression efforts to have five of the six largest fires in state history burning simultaneously. You know, and then our, our fire record, record starts in 1932. So just to give you a sense of the, the, the scale that we were facing, um, it was just unprecedented. And, and it was devastating for so many people and we're grateful that it wasn't more devastating um, because it easily could have been uh, in terms of loss of life. So why don't I take us through, I was gonna give everyone um, just a little bit of a fire history 101 in California, kind of how we got here, what are some of the factors, and then talk through how um, this budget is really a paradigm shift for us to be able to meet the scale of the crisis. We've been operating um, at a what was a scaled up pace, but to give you a sense, the, uh, for the fourth climate assessment released in 2018, impacts of climate change, um, really hit us in, um, a, it, it predicted that there would be a 77% increase in acres burned annually in California by 2100. This last year, we had a 15 100% increase in acres burned um, in one season. We had 4.1 million acres burned this year. Last year, we had, um, had 277,000 acres burned. 
and our average, uh, which is higher than usual, uh, was around 800 to 900,000 acres burned a year. So this year was dramatically higher than anything we had seen. And essentially the climate change we were predicting at the end of the century came um, 180 years early. So I am going to um, show you guys a couple uh, pictures that I think really highlight this. Um, and try to share my screen here. Hopefully that's working. And uh, and I just want to make sure we're on the same page of the history. You know, California's wildlands uh, were managed by prescribed fire uh, by Native Americans for millennia. This is generally a fire adapted ecology. And um, you had colonization, which um, suppressed tribal fire and cultural fire on the landscape. And then you had gold rush era clear cutting which wiped out most of California's old growth forests. What grew back were thin, um, small, overly dense trees, really thickly stocked acres um, of trees, which usually after a couple decades, fire would come through, thin out the, um, under, uh, the underbrush and the weaker trees and results you know, over a 50 year period in a more even, uh, you know, even uh, evenly spaced um, stand where the trees aren't competing for scarce nutrients and resources. However, uh, there was a political decision that I want to highlight for people that I think is really important to share that around the turn of the century, this radical concept of public land um, from the conservation movement with Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot leading the, uh, the brand new Forest Service with its mandate of protecting public land was highly unpopular with uh, turn of the century Congress. And they, rather than opposing the conservation movement, just refused to fund the Forest Service. So they refused to enforce, to fund the enforcers of protecting public land. So Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt framed the Forest Service as a fire suppression agency to be able to make the political trade-off they understood the ecology of the day that fire had a role on the landscape, but to ensure the survival of public land, they made this trade off and ignored the science. And so that's a really crucial lesson for us that the Forest Service then legacy of fire suppression, which has led to significantly overstocked um, stands of, of forests and, um, and compounded now a century later, that was a decision when they made the politics try to adapt to, they made the ecology try to adapt to the politics. And our goal is to make sure that we don't make that mistake, that we ensure that the politics fits into the realities of the ecology because what we are facing is a multi-generational crisis and we need solutions that not only deliver impact now, but will also, um, that will also yield results and benefits and um, sustainable ecology for the next generations to come. So this is just a little reminder of the role of wildfire on a forest. Um, on one side of the screen, you have a fire suppressed forest where it's overly dense. That means the fuel load is really high. The lower trees um, deliver fire into the tree canopies where they are weakest. And then you end up with um, a really high severity burn um, where it, con it has compounding consequences of lack of carbon sequestration, lack of air quality, um, and lack of habitat, lack of biodiversity, um, and compounds because then it causes runoff and mudslides and, um, and impacts the water table down the line because then that soil is burned um, too deep and it's no longer being an absorptive capacity. And so your mountains and some of your uh, wildlands no longer uh, serve as their water storage or filtration function. Um, so it also compounds drought. Uh, on the other side of the screen, you have an ecologically managed forest. So a forest that is thinned, um, managed with prescribed fire, um, which burns out the undergrowth. Then when a fire does come through, those trees stand and survive and you don't have as hot of a fire on the soil and you retain the ecological function and the biodiversity and the safety of that forest and the community surrounding it. So just to give you a sense of how a legacy of fire manage, mismanagement um, and 
uh, the legacy of fire suppression has caught up to us with climate change now has really is really what we're seeing come together to catalyze this exponential growth in fires. And, uh, and so this is a picture um, around the Shaver Lake area, which is where the Creek fire broke out this year of tree mortality. That's forest service land. And um, it hadn't been particularly thinned um, over the previous decades. And so those trees were overly dense. And from 2012 to 2015, we had a one in thousand year drought. And so that caused massive tree mortality because these trees were too stressed and couldn't compete with each other. Um, they didn't have enough sap to push out uh, the endemic bark beetle, which population went unchecked also because there wasn't coal, uh, cold die off for them in the winter. And so you ended up with 169 million trees dying throughout California um, in, from, as a result from that drought and the beetle pandemic. And what's really compelling about the beetle pandemic is that they target wider diameter trees. And so usually we anticipate fuel load both based on the branches or smaller trees that hit the ground. Um, and so the fallen tree, the fallen fuel the, on the ground is usually driven by three inch diameter wood. What we were seeing with the beetle kill is that it was killing 30 inch diameter trees. This year, those trees finally started to fall down. So now you have a ground fuel load of wide diameter wood in high density areas, particularly in the Southern Sierra. That led to a catastrophic scale of heat coming off of these fires. So it's a phenomenon called standing combustion, where um, you don't have, usually you have a fire front and then smoldering in the middle. This was active flames throughout the entire footprint of the fire for the Creek fire, for example. And this is just one example of this this summer. Um, and so that is a 50,000 foot um, pyrocumulonimbus, which uh, is essentially a smoke pillar that creates its own weather system. So that forest fire was so hot because of all those dead standing trees, which again, their fuel moisture had really dried out too. So not only did you have the cascading impact of a drought killing off the trees, which then fell over, changing these sort of traditional dynamics of fire behavior on the ground, you also had unprecedented heat waves, which dried out that dead fuel on the ground. So we had 6% moisture in that area around Shaver Lake in those dead fuel, in those dead trees. Um, which is really unheard of. You had 12% um, moisture is kiln dried, professionally sold wood, lumber. So this is drier than uh, professionally dried wood because we recorded the hottest you know, heat in the planet, 130 degrees in Death Valley this summer. Um, and that triggered those dry lightning strikes which hit this dry, uh, tinderbox and the forest went up catastrophically. And when that pillar collapsed um, from the upper atmosphere, it would drop down and it did a number of times. It would uh, push out a 60 to 80 mile an hour wind in every direction. It came down like a splat. That's how you had people trapped and stranded and the National Guard coming in to rescue people um, in those fires because it's really erratic behavior and difficult to predict. Um, and so this just is one example of the over 9,000 fires that we had burning this year and demonstrating how forest health and, um, and uh, climate change really came together to create something that was unprecedented and really difficult to respond to. Uh, it, these fires created things like fire tornadoes. Uh, this particular one is the Loyalton fire um, up above Tahoe this summer, but there is hope. Um, so we understand that California is a fire adapted ecology. And so whether you're talking about trees or sh chaparral where it needs, a, uh, it needs less fire on the landscape and uh, we want to get our forests back to and our wildlands back to their natural fire ecology. And so there is hope because as we're facing hotter temperatures, the question is, what do these landscapes look like? How do these native plants fare? So just give a guess. You can put it in the chat, which I can't actually see right now, but to entertain each other, give a guess where this forest is. I'll give you a second. Okay, this forest is in Baja, California. So this is a forest that was never um, 
touched by uh, clear cutting or logging. It's been managed by lightning and uh, natural fire throughout its life. And so it is in hotter temperatures and still retains um, healthy conifers. And, and so just to give you a sense that we have tools to be able to have our landscapes be able to withstand um, the increasing temperatures that we're inevitably facing. Um, and then once they stand, uh, these are actually really helpful tools in helping to cool the planet's temperatures and reabsorb a lot of that carbon that's getting released. So there are three fronts to wildfire resilience and we need to invest in all three fronts and depending on the community and its surrounding ecology, you're gonna need different levels of these three scales of investment. So I like to, so if you look at them, we have, um, sometimes it's easy to think of them as like concentric circles, um, if you picture your house and radiating out. But um, so our, our real last stand is to make sure that we have our communities hardened um, and our homes hardened against catastrophic fire. So that's to ensure that we are investing in um, home hardening. We have that homes burn from the inside out in a in a fire and so simple retrofits can make a big difference in a home survivability and you have to have a certain percentage of a community hardened to in, prevent the homes from then becoming the high heat ignition sources for that fire um defensible space to create that um, spot around your home that prevents it from catching fire um, and your community infrastructure to ensure that you have safe escape routes and wide enough roads to be able to survive a fire. We also have the wildland urban interface. This is where we invest in um, strategic fuel breaks, which are often along sides of roads as escape routes or areas where firefighters can stage equipment and take a stand to prevent a fire from coming into a community. As you'll remember, Governor Newsom announced 35 emergency fuel breaks and deployed the National Guard last year to be able to put those in um, in record time. And they were done in time for this fire season and saved um, homes and communities and lives uh, just in huge numbers because uh, those were a, they were they were a huge tool with a such a, a catastrophic fire season. Um, and then the last area is really this landscape resilience. And this is where we have a lot of tools to kind of put all hands on deck um, because we have 57% of our wildlands are owned by the Forest Service, 3% are owned by California and 40% are privately owned. And so we need different strategies for different landscapes that match that ecology and, um, and allow people across jurisdictions to be able to engage in active management so that we're not only improving community safety, but we're protecting our watersheds too. Because if we allow these watersheds to burn year after year, we've compounded the drought crisis that we're seeing. And also as you allow sort of these giant smoke pillars like, I, like this one, um, to burn even in forested areas, what you're doing is releasing black carbon into the atmosphere, which causes heat spikes. And then you feel the impact in the Central Valley or Southern California um, areas where they really don't have a lot of heat resilience um, because they're already at those max temperatures. So um, just to give you a sense of some of the, uh, how a lot of these tools really interrelate, interrelate to each other. So, what we are really trying to do then with the governor's budget and a billion dollar investment is a huge increase. We were at 75 million last year. So this demonstrates a major paradigm shift and we are trying to put dollars in and right size um, all three of these. And, I, and, and we're trying and we have a lot of tools on the ground already to do the wildland urban interface and landscape strategies. And we're really rolling out strong pilots and um, to be able to build a foundation to demonstrate and prove what we can do on home hardening. Um, so this is about getting us to a real scaled effort and um, scaling up at full sprint. And the goal again on the landscape uh, is to ensure that we are actively investing in prescribed fire in treatments that thin out the forest so that when fire does come through it's resilient. And, you know, even though I keep using the term forest, um, you know, we're talking about 
um, grasslands and meadows and um, and oak woodlands and for chaparral ecosystems, you want to keep fire off oak woodlands, you want to put low fire back on so you want fire to return to its natural banks. And we need to put the tools in place to do that. So we proposed a really robust investment here. Um, you'll recognize our forest health program. Those are um, investments that go across, uh, you know, we've given grants down to um, chaparral ecosystems. Um, down in Southern California to um, Coastal Sage to, um, I think a lot of you on the call have received these forest health grants. We're gonna continue those. Um, we also wanna make sure we are engaging small forest landowners. 26% of our wildlands are owned by small family landowners and they often cannot afford to make the improvements needed to, to be able to thin out and make their landscape resilient. Um, and so this would in, improve the California Forest Improvement Program, $50 million to really help them um, achieve resilience uh, across those small forest landowners. We're also investing in the Cal Fire Nursery to ensure and our forest legacy program. Um, $14 million for forest legacy goes to larger landowners to encourage them to commit to conserve their land. That means not hand over for development and actively manage it so that it's delivering the ecological goals of biodiversity, carbon sequestration, um, forest health writ large. Um, we've also invested in the nursery program, which would allow us to do a lot of reforestation um, and on the post-fire landscape so that we're not getting that cascading impact of losing our watersheds. We're also investing in urban forestry to really help with that um, heat program. That's been something that has come out of our cap and trade funds traditionally. And we have $20 million specifically for tribes as well, because our, uh, we need to encourage and ensure that we are integrating that traditional ecological knowledge into our management practices. And that tribes that own large patches of land um, have the tools to actively manage it and aren't um, constantly stuck funding one part or another. Um, and can actually complete full projects uh, with the dollars we're giving them. We're also really making a commitment to ensure that the unique landscapes that the state has set aside um, as state owned land or state parks or fish and wildlife are, have been set aside because they are some of the most ecologically diverse and, um, and important uh, sort of landscapes for future generations. And so, we want to make sure that we are not losing them to catastrophic fire. We had over 100,000 acres of state park land burned this summer and 40,000 acres of fish and wildlife land. And so we are um, investing in ensuring that our state landowners actually have the tools to proactively manage land um, and hit acreage treatment targets. Then we are going to start investing um, concentrated amounts of dollars in regions where they have pipelines of shovel ready projects. So when they are ready to go with a project rather than saying, hey, great, apply for this grant and do phase one of your project. And then in three years, you can apply for another grant and do phase two of your project. We saw catastrophic impacts from that this summer um, up around the sheep fire, for example. There were lots of projects identified um, and in different phases of completion and the areas that had been fully treated, the fire behaved like an ecological fire, germinating seeds um, and was low and easy to approach. And in areas where it hadn't been treated yet, it was a catastrophic fire and destroyed five homes. So we wanna make sure that we are fully completing um, projects that are ready to go. And so one of our first regions that's been really good with partnerships and also owns uh, is home to most of California's watersheds and is the highest fire risk region in the state, um, the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. And so we put funding into um, Sierra Nevada Conservancy to be able to complete a hundred projects that they have already identified um, that are prepped with the community and ready to go to be able to get that resilience delivered in a cohesive way so that we're not having kind of random acts of conservation across the landscape. Um, and then we're also funding the Tahoe Conservancy to be able to fully execute. They own 6,400 plots around Lake Tahoe, um, many of which are in need of treatment. They're in neighborhoods. And so this would treat those plots so that you don't have neighbors um, uh, looking at state land as a fire hazard for them. It also improves the water quality around the lake to have, um, to have those uh, forested plots be 
at their ecological norm. So the next area is really strategic fuel breaks. This just gives you a vision of like what a completed fuel break looks like. Um, it's often buffering a road, it's thin strips of uh, forest or wildlands so that you don't have vegetation touching the road. Um, we had devastating impacts of, of, of Californians dying on roads in the campfire, for example, in part because you had um, fuel uh, over, you had, you had vegetation over the road, it was on fire. And so when you have flames licking cars, people can't get out and their cars melt. And so we put fuel brakes along roads to have escape routes, even in a worst case scenario of a wind driven fire skipping um, that road, you have a way for people to get out. So we're really investing in those strategic fuel brakes. Um, they're gonna be done by CAL FIRE units are gonna continue their efforts to do those directly, um, increasing their prescribed fire and hand crews as well to do both fuel brakes and some of this uh, larger forest uh, work. We'll have our fire prevention grants, which can both fund fuel breaks and home and community hardening projects. Those are really um, designed to allow the community to tell us what they need so that we can fund it. Um, and then we'll be funding the Forestry Corps uh, through the California Conservation Corps to be able to increase our workforce that can both be out doing hand crews for strategic fuel breaks and also to do um, uh, to do some of the reforestation and landscape restoration work. One of the more exciting things that I think is particularly relevant to this group is a real investment in the Regional Forest and Fire Capacity Program. And this goes not just in forested landscapes, we have, um, uh, we're expanding it into more areas of Southern California as well. Um, it's right now in Santa Barbara and uh, uh, San Bernardino, sorry, and uh, expanding it to Orange County and others. And this is really to ensure that communities have a cohesive approach to fire. One of the challenges I've been hearing from discussions with many of your members um, who have received our grants is that they often have to wait until their projects are shovel ready to receive our grant dollars but they don't have the upfront funding for planning what they need to do in the region or doing the ecological or environmental assessments needed to get those projects ready to go. And so the goal of these dollars um, with this Con Department of Conservation program is to give fundings to regions. So whether it's resource conservation districts, water boards um, or, uh, or local counties, um, community organizations, local parks, can come together and have resources to really plan out and map out what they need in their region for wildfire resilience funding. And this is to be able to say, yes, we need a regional strategy that tells us what amount we are investing in home hardening, in strategic fuel breaks, in um, landscape resilience, in community infrastructure. And so that that community is really driving a cohesive vision because the plan for the Sierra is going to be different than what's needed in Orange County and it's going to be different than what is needed um, along the coast in Monterey. And so we need to have, ensure that not only are we providing large scale resources, but they are being driven by the realities of the community and the ecology which they are going into. And so the goal of these programs is to really ensure that we're giving communities tools to be able to come up with those robust resilient strategies so that our grant dollars that we're giving out in these fire prevention programs and the forest health dollars are then being much more strategically utilized to deliver the end goals of that community. Um, it also, fingers crossed, will enable those communities to have plans that federal partners and other partners can then invest in that um, can make it easier to match up the state investment. Um, that last ring of defense is really this home hardening and defensible space zone. And um, I realized I've talked almost this whole time, so I apologize, um, but wanted to get you guys full detail on all of this. So really defensible space is crucial. We have invested a lot in community education and outreach um, and uh, defensible space inspectors. We are investing in land use planners um, from the state fire marshal to be able to come to communities to provide expert advice on how they are planning and developing that community and ensuring that they have those emergency plans designed into um, their communities. And 
One of the gaps though, is also ensuring that low income homeowners can have the access to home hardening. And so this is a new program that we are piloted, piloting and really want to be able to start scaling up um, uh, you know, in the coming year. And so what we're seeing is to be able to get homeowners to harden their homes, they need to know what to do. Um, and so we've been investing in that education. There's about 2 million homes uh, in California that are in need of these home hardening retrofits. And so we're hoping that a lot of homeowners will take the education and tools and put the right vents on their home and clean out their gutters and take some of those simple steps. But for the homeowners that can't afford it, um, we are rolling out a uh, 25 million state dollar investment and um, 75 million federal matching. So $100 million home hardening program that um, you're seeing on this screen is reflected as 25 million. Um, the goal of that is to really roll out um, a robust program that helps us partner um, with homeowners that need help hardening their homes so that communities can start reaching that saturation level. We've been in discussions with the California Fire Safe Councils and Habitat for Humanity and local conservation corps about potentially coming up with a partnership that allows local community volunteerism to also help execute some of these programs on the ground in communities and get those dollars to stretch even further to more homes hardened. Um, so this is finally funding and piloting a program that has been desperately needed for a long time. And we are hoping that um, this is just an initial investment that then scales up as the program is ready to go. And again, 25 million um, from the state, and that'll be matched by 75 million um, from FEMA mitigation grants, bringing it to a $100 million program. Also in here um, are UC um, fire advisors. That's been a really effective program reaching out to communities on this education front, we're including 11 new University of California Extension uh, fire advisors throughout the state. The last area is really making sure that we are getting the foundations right. So making sure that we have the workforce trained and ready to go to hire. We've been noticing that programs are getting slowed down because there aren't contractors to hire to do this work or you're competing with each other for one contractor and it's driving up the price per, per acre. So we're investing $24 million in workforce development. And then uh, the other challenge has been, what do we do with this woody biomass? And how do we get small businesses to start up around this vision? And so, as you can see, that biomass challenge is pretty significant. And there've been a lot of barriers to entry. So we're um, increasing uh, the, we're launching the Climate Catalyst Fund which would be a $47 million revolving loan fund that would give low interest loans to anybody wanting to work in the forest sector, especially if they're doing innovation around what can we do with these slash piles rather than, um, rather than uh, pile burn them and release that carbon. Can we turn it into biodiesel or building material um, for smaller diameter wood? Can we turn it into cross laminated timber and sequester that carbon. This replaces steel beams and concrete in construction. Um, and so there's a lot of areas where we can invest here. $24 million into workforce training. Um, and, uh, and then really making sure that we don't make the mistake of uh, our friends Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt that we actually do let the ecology tell us what the right steps are. And so really investing in remote sensing, research, monitoring, demonstration forests to test out these techniques, understand the impact they have on chaparral ecosystems, on rolling oak woodlands, on coastal, um, on the unique uh, in coastal sage, you know, the unique ecologies that we have in California to make sure that this is really going out effectively. Um, and then we're putting out some money for um, permit efficiencies as well to ensure that when you're applying for a project through the Cal VTP that you have the resources you need, um, that the, the permits are just kind of a one-stop shop for the Cal VTP, um, that, uh, that you're able to get your ecological monitoring done in a way that we're coordinated on the back end of the state and you're seeing more of a seamless process on the front end. So um, I may have eaten all of our time. I, I can stick around and answer some questions, but I really wanted to give you guys a sense of what's in this budget and, and really ask you to step up and advocate it, advocate for this. If there are things in here that you see 
are essential. We would ask you to show up at the budget hearings to reach out um, to your members and ask for these resources because we've put together what's really a cohesive strategy designed to be a foundational investment in wildfire resilience in California. And we need this to last and we need it to grow. And, and so we need this package to come forward um, complete. And so we'd ask your support in getting it done and through the legislature. Jessica, thank you. Um, I, I, first of all, just wanna appreciate that this budget that you showed us as well as your work in general is trying to approach fire and forest management from so many different angles. And you've been such an active partner in listening to um, folks who are managing lands across the state. Um, a, a somewhat simple question that came in was around uh, a program like RFFC, the Regional Forest and Fire Capacity Program. Can a nonprofit doing collaborative work across the region with different agency partners apply for funding out of that program? Yes, or do they yes. need to be some specific state model? No, 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 that's the goal of that program. Exactly what you laid out. It's it's nonprofits, it's like there are uh, watershed coordinators to that program to be able to reach out and try to identify who the players are on the ground, um, who all the stakeholders are and get them to be more coordinated. It, it is essentially tools for you to be able to coordinate on the ground um, in your community. We're rolling it out by uh, region and um, and Kaylee Bright at uh, Department of Conservation is leading this up and it is an outstanding program that has delivered. And so we really wanted it to be robust because we need this to be driven by local voices on the ground and local knowledge. It's great to see budget and support for that program. And the other question, I loved your visual of the three main areas of working with fire, you know, and there's like the fire hardening and the, the work around the home. There's the wooey work, the wildland urban interface, and then there's the larger scale forest management or vegetation management work. And your budget addresses so much of that. And a couple of questions that I've seen come in um, really get to coordination on two fronts. One is, you know, potentially local communities can play an important role because you can develop local tax measures, you have local policy initiatives and other things that really complement state investments and state policy work. But you also have a variety of state programs. You mentioned the Cal VTP, the Vegetation Treatment Program, as well as RFFC and others. Um, from where you sit, uh, what are the various ways that the state is working to coordinate with the local level as well as across different state agencies and programs to make sure that this is all working well together? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things we, we're, we're trying to make sure that we're good listeners and responding to concerns on the ground. You know, one of the early concerns we had with like the Cal VTP, which is, you know, in, in policy land, it creates the opportunity to reduce your CEQA timeline from, you know, two years to two months but it's also a thousand page document that you have to figure out how to navigate. And so one of the things we're funding in this budget is um, funding for uh, templates for, for essentially the Board of Forestry to take the lead on doing the analysis on over 40 projects, many of which will be our grantees, to uh, across landscapes um, and geographies so that there is a template for the VTP to be done by the um, environmental uh, lawyers that wrote the VTP to ensure that there's a really high standard for it that then everyone else in that ecology or um, area can then just copy, copy and paste from that they can then follow that model so they don't have to interpret it or figure it out on their own they can have a really clear high ecological standard already set for them to then be able to mirror without a lot of effort. So there are things like that that we're trying to do. I think the Regional Forest and Fire Capacity Program is really crucial. Um, one of the goals, part of the goal of that is for that to make sure that our grant dollars are being more aligned strategically. I mean, our goal with the Regional Forest and Fire Capacity Program is to get regions to come together um, across owners and stakeholders to develop that regional strategy to get projects, um, pipe, project pipelines ready, they can still apply for grants for one-off projects in the meantime. But once they have a pipeline of projects ready to go, we wanna do what we did with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, where we then just fund the whole pipeline. That, um, you know, I think the North, uh, North Coast uh, Regional Partnership, is that what it is? Um, that they've also been a really good model of already have regional planning ready to go, have project pipelines ready to go. So, you know, I'd say that there's some regions that are ready for this larger infusion of coordinated targeted dollars. Um, and that's also why we're trying to roll out the scientific dollars too, 
that uh, that getting us an investment in um, in remote sensing, uh, you know, so that we can have lidar, or hyperspectral, or satellite imagery and ground data combined allows us to then leverage some of the planning tools that are underway that ensures that our predictive models and our planning models are based on the realities of the ecology on the ground, as opposed to sort of past data from 10 years ago that may no longer be relevant. And so making sure that then we have some models that can say, hey, here's your watershed and here's your region. Here's what you guys need for carbon sequestration. Here's what you need for biodiversity. And, and to be able to map out where the projects that are planned fit in there and identify where the gaps are and then work with the regions to provide funding and resources and tools to fill those gaps. We're gonna have to wrap up pretty soon, but I do have one more question. And Devin, if you wanna put in the chat some information about how to sign up for the network's uh, mailing list, that would be great. The last question that we have time for, oh, I also wanna to mention to participants that we will forward on all the questions to Jessica so she can review all of those um, on our behalf. Um, you know, the shared stewardship agreement with the Forest Service, I'm just curious from your viewpoint, where are things headed with that federal partnership and co-stewarding our federal and state public lands and partnership with local communities through that agreement? Yeah, I mean, that shared stewardship agreement really does show um, it is a 20 year joint strategy with the Forest Service. We were so grateful that it was able to be sort of under the political radar and be a very science-based, climate-based um, approach, which we think the new Biden administration will um, embrace. and. And so we, you know, with the Great American Outdoors Act, suddenly the Forest Service is looking at having real funding and resources across our federal partners. And so we're hoping that the state is sending a clear signal that, um, you know, what, everything we've laid out in this budget is part of our goal within that shared stewardship agreement. And so we want to make sure that we're setting a standard of saying, hey, the state's investing here, and we want our federal partners to be able to match those investments. That's, again, why that local regional coordination is so crucial because it helps coordinate. So we can coordinate at the policy level and get resources unlocked. Um, but to be able to execute it on the ground, it's those regional partnerships that are going to really deliver that help coordinate Cal Fire and Forest Service and others um, and, and tribes and counties um, to really come together and design something that is right and adapted for that community. But, um, but yeah, we're hoping that they're partnering with us on everything from the workforce development pieces to the um, investments in wood innovation to really ramping up our targets. I mean, the state has identified a target of 500,000 acres a year. This budget should allow us to hit that um, by probably 2023, uh, which is a couple years earlier than originally planned. And our Forest Service um, friends, we're hoping that they're able to then follow suit and ramp up as well. That's excellent. <laughs> Uh, Deputy Secretary Morris, I just want to really thank you for your time being here. And um, I just want to wish everyone who participated well. Again, we will be passing on your questions. And feel free to sign up, um, join us in our work as the California Landscape Stewardship Network. And we'll be in touch soon. Thanks again. Thanks so much. Look forward to working with all of you. <laughs>